Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Miriam Heyer. I'm the Senior Director for External Affairs here at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. Uh, this is the, the third largest Holocaust museum in the world and the primary resource for teaching and learning about the Holocaust in the New York area. Uh, one of the things that we're working on right now is we are launching New York's Holocaust curriculum so that students throughout the boroughs will receive lesson plans developed by this museum in partnership with the New York City Department of Education. So it's a very interesting, very um, good time to be here. And uh, this work that we do on the educational side is supplemented by a lot of our public programs and our exhibitions. Uh, tonight's public program, I'm very happy to um, welcome you all uh, to a, the, a, a book event, really, um, but also a, a conversation uh, between two members of the third generation. Um, I also want to welcome, by the way, our online audience who's with us on live streaming. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the format of tonight. Um, so this event is about belonging, which is the uh, visual memoir by Nora Krug. Uh, we are lucky enough to have Nora with us tonight, so she's going to present some of her work and uh, read a little bit from the uh, graphic novel or, or the visual memoir so that you all can um, get a sense of the work. And uh, I want to tell you a little bit about Nora, um, who has really um, written something that is at once personal and, uh, and also something that is really a deep exploration of history. Uh, Nora Krug is a German-American author and illustrator whose drawings and visual narratives have appeared in publications including the New York Times. This is a great reminder if you could all silence your cell phones. Thank you. Nora Krug is a German-American author and illustrator whose drawings and visual narratives have appeared in publications including the New York Times, The Guardian, and A Public Space. Krug is a recipient of fellowships from Fulbright, the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation, the Pollock Krasner Foundation, the Maurice Sendak Foundation, and the German Academic Exchange Service. Her books are included in the Library of Congress and the Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Columbia University. Nora's illustrations have been recognized with three gold medals and one silver medal from the Society of Illustrators and a silver cube from the New York Art Directors Club and her visual biography, Kamikaze, about a surviving Japanese World War II pilot, was included in Mifflin's Best American Comics and Best Non-Required Reading. Krug's work has been exhibited internationally, and her animations were shown at the Sundance Film Festival. She is an associate professor in the illustration program at the Parsons School of Design in New York City. So the way we're gonna format this is Nora will come up and talk about her book. We'll be able to see um, some visuals as well. And uh, that portion of the evening will be followed by a conversation with Sarah Cameras. I hope many of you were here for our Pod Conveners program, so perhaps you'll recognize Sarah, who is a New York-based producer and director of short form and branded content. Sarah currently works as a producer at Great Big Story, a global media company devoted to cinematic storytelling. Previously, Sarah produced award-winning news videos at Now This as a senior creative producer for original series. Um, so what we, what we did for Sarah's Pod Conveners film program was we had Sarah present her work, we screened a few of the films, and then we had her in conversation with another member of the third generation. So making sure that these programs include not only um, kind of new work and interesting offerings for the public, but also really rich conversations. Without further ado, here's Nora. Hi, thanks so much for coming, uh, feel, and thanks for, so much for having me here. I'm very glad and also touched that um, this event is possible, uh, you know, over 80 years after these horrible things happened. Um, so my book is called Belonging, and um, it is a 280-page, fully illustrated uh, visual memoir about World War II and my own German family history. The unforgivable atrocities my country committed during World War II cast a long shadow all throughout my childhood, and my years as a teenager were accompanied by a tremendous sense of inherited guilt. But even though we continuously learned about the Holocaust in school and analyzed Adolf Hitler's speeches word by word, 
This page on the left is actually taken from my exercise book, uh, 11th grade exercise book, where I analyzed one of his speeches. Even though we visited concentration camp museums and spoke to survivors, the guilt we grew into remained abstract, and conversations about what happened in our own families were non-existent. By the time I learned about the Holocaust, all my grandparents had died, and I had missed my chance to ask them directly about their lives under the Nazi regime. My guilt and the gaping hole that was my family's history left me with a feeling of emotional paralysis and cultural disorientation. Because my cultural identity was so deeply entangled with my country's past, I grew up rejecting any notion of a German tradition leaving me not to take pride in any of my country's cultural achievements that existed long before the Nazis came to power. My friends and I never learned old folk songs. We struck the words for hero and pride from our vocabularies. We never learned the lyrics to our national anthem, and we watched with relief when the players of the German soccer team remained silent as the anthem was played before kickoff. As a German living abroad for 20 years, I've often been aware that my accent alone can evoke the mem memory of the Nazis' crimes. As a German amongst non-Germans, I've often been confronted with negative notions of German identity. I was greeted with Heil Hitler in England and in Japan, and I was once spat at at a market in Brooklyn and told to go back to Germany. But I was also met with sincere interest by people who asked me questions about my own family history, which I didn't know how to answer. It was only then that I realized that all throughout my childhood, asking each other what happened in our families, in our own home hometowns, had been an unspoken taboo. Over the years of my living abroad, I felt both a growing urge and a responsibility to confront my own family's history in a new way and to ask those questions I never had a chance to ask before. Through a combination of full-page illustrations, short comics, and family photographs, the book follows my journey as I seek out lost relatives and consult archives for any evidence about my family's life under the Nazi regime. It follows the stories of my grandfather, a driving teacher in my hometown during the war, and a Nazi party member, he's depicted on the left, and my uncle, who died as an SS soldier in Italy at age 19. Neither of them were major war criminals, resistance fighters, or victims under the regime. I feel that it is important to shed light on people like my uncle and my grandfather, on those who fall in between the categories of the heroes and the culprits, those who represent the large gray mass whose lives are often deemed too insignificant to research more deeply, whose guilt or innocence is impossible to measure in order to understand how dictatorial regimes come to be. Interwoven into the family narrative are pages that I entitled From the Scrapbook of a Memory Archivist, which feature objects, letters, and photographs from the 1930s and 40s that I found at flea markets across Germany over the years of my search, things that provided the tangible, evidential experience of war that my own grandparents and uncle weren't able to provi provide me with. These pages are arranged thematically throughout the narrative. My book is as much a search into my family as it is a search into German cultural identity. The book contains encyclopedic pages called From the Notebook of a Homesick Emigre, Things German, which catalog objects, activities, and places which to me are deeply rooted in the German consciousness, aspects of my culture that were often misappropriated by the Nazis and whose emotional meaning I only became aware of during my working on the book while living far away from Germany and looking at it from a distance. To me, drawing is an act of empathy. Illustration forces me to make historic events and processes visible. By illustrating my grandfather's and uncle's stories and memories, I can picture more clearly the situations they found themselves in during the war, while I test the limits of my own empathy towards the decisions they made. The main theme of belonging is identity. My own identity, my family's identity, and the identity of my country, which remains so difficult to grasp. 
On a more universal level, I hope to gain a clearer understanding of the effect that history has over generations and of the role that the memory of war, collective and personal, plays in the shaping of cultural identity. I'm going to read a uh, chapter from the book. It's called Number Three, Poisonous Mushrooms. Every year we travel to Italy for a family vacation. To us, Italy represented everything Germany didn't have, or perhaps elements it once had, but lost in the perfectionist reconstruction of the post-war years. Here we could feel uninhibited and live the exotic fantasy of Southern European life. We spent days driving around in our non-air-conditioned green Volvo, exploring small medieval towns, sampling local delicacies, visiting remote museums, and following in the footsteps of famous artists, writers, and filmmakers. On one of those excursions, we visited a large military cemetery. The cemetery's geometric precision was intimidating. Near the entrance, we found an inscription in German. Selig sind die da Leid tragen, denn sie sollen getröstet werden. Blessed are they who are suffering, for they shall be comforted. Buried beneath our feet lay the bodies of German, not Italian, World War II soldiers. A few decades after the end of the war, 30,683 of them had been dug up for identification from nearby provisional graves and finally reburied here. The cemetery was vast. We made our way through the labyrinth in silence. Suddenly, my father disappeared. After a while, we spotted him in the distance. He walked briskly and held a piece of paper in his hands. What are you looking for? My brother. I'd always known that I had an uncle who died young. He fell in the war, my father used to say, but nobody in my family seemed to know how or where he was killed. I knew that my uncle had been the heir to my grandparents' land in Kölsheim, a tiny town in the southwest of Germany, surrounded by fields, forests, and vineyards. I knew that my father was born a few years after my uncle's death and that his parents had named him after his dead brother, Franz Karl. I knew that because my uncle had died, they expected my father to inherit and tend to their farm, to look after the animals, the fields, and the plum trees. And I knew that my father had never fulfilled that expectation. As a teenager, I discovered a musty-smelling box in the drawer of a mahogany cabinet in our living room. It contained old photographs of my uncle and a few of his sixth grade school exercise books. They described the life cycle of the Maybach and the history of European forestry, the heroic Viking adventures and the havoc of the Thirty Years' War, the importance of charity and the necessity for personal hygiene, the Führer's difficult childhood and his reintroduction of Mother's Day to celebrate German women and their Aryan children. Number two, how I honored my darling mother. When I woke up on Mother's Day, I quickly got out of bed and put on my clothes, then quickly into the garden to pick a bunch of flowers, which I put next to Mother's bed. When she woke up, I gave her my best Mother's Day wishes. Then I went out into the kitchen and put a cup on the table for her. On the cup, it said Mother's Day. I also put a piece of cake on the table. At noon, I went into the forest and picked a bunch of mayflowers for her. May 31st, 1938. All throughout my father's childhood, his mother told him that his brother had been a sweet and well-behaved boy. Unlike my father, who was a stubborn and ill-tempered child. My father spent days skipping first kindergarten, then school, playing all by himself on the grounds of Kulsheim's medieval castle. My uncle was a complete stranger to me. I didn't know anyone who had known him. War and death were the only things I associated with him. Because he had been one of Hitler's soldiers, I learned early on that I wasn't supposed to feel sadness over his early death. 
His photos and exercise books were the only physical evidence of his existence, and I tried desperately to find him somewhere in between the lines of his propagandistic essays. It was like searching a concrete wall for cracks and leaks. Examining the stories written in my uncle's neat handwriting and the illustrations with which he carefully decorated the margins was an intimate but chilling experience. The books intrigued me, but I never showed them to any of my friends. This is a little difficult to read and listen to. Number 11, the Jew, a poisonous mushroom. When you go to the forest and you see mushrooms that look beautiful, you think that they are good. But when you eat them, they are poisonous and can kill a whole family. The Jew is just like this mushroom. When you see the Jew from behind, you don't immediately recognize him. But if you talk to him, you recognize him immediately. He pretends to be nice and flatters you shamelessly. Just like the poisonous mushroom can kill a whole family, the Jew can kill a whole people. Kölsheim, January 20th, 1939. From the notebook of a homesick emigre, things German number three, das Pilze sammeln. Collecting mushrooms with my family, examining each mushroom carefully and comparing it to the corresponding picture in the Pilzführer mushroom guidebook before placing it in the woven basket. Back home, scrubbing off the bits of earth on the stem and in between the gills, and then sauteing the mushrooms in a pan with butter, salt, and pepper, and eating them with a piece of dark rye bread. By eating the mushrooms, I feel as if I've become part of the forest. The poisonous red and white polka-dotted mushroom is depicted in many German children's books. On New Year's Day, it is a symbol of good luck that appears in shop windows, on greeting cards, and in marzipan sweets made in its shape. My mother dressed as a poisonous mushroom, 1953. Costume made by my grandmother. To this day, she remembers the moment the picture was taken because of how disappointed she was that she couldn't be a princess instead. My uncle signed his name beneath the mushroom story and added the date, January 20th, 1939. On that same day, the mayor of Dachau reports that the town is now cleared of all Jews. A hearing in Berlin takes place about the sterilization of a mentally unstable woman. Stalin endorses the use of torture. And Josef Goebbels writes in his diary, Talk things through with the Führer for two hours. He's so good and humane to me, one has to love him. Ten days later, Adolf Hitler will give a speech proclaiming that if Jewish financiers should plunge the nations into a world war yet again, the outcome will be the annihilation of the Jewish race in Europe. Was my uncle's story influenced by the poisonous mushroom? the 1938 collection of anti-Semitic children's stories. The book was given out for free by the National Socialists. In one of the stories, a mother and her blonde, lederhosen-clad son go for a walk in the forest where she compares Jews to poisonous mushrooms. Coincidentally, the name of the boy in the story was Franz, the same name as my uncle's. It takes great effort to learn to write. How much effort did it take my uncle to write a story like the one about the mushroom? Content two, spelling, uh, sorry, content B, spelling C, calligraphy C. The teacher marked three spelling mistakes and two grammatical mistakes in the mushroom story and signed it ST. Although he expected my uncle to do better, he was satisfied with the story's content. Adolf Hitler, 1938. Our youth shall learn nothing but to think German and to act German. A young boy or a young girl enters into our organizations at age 10. Then they move on from the junior Hitler youth to the Hitler youth four years later, and we will keep them there for another four years, and then put them into the party or the labor front, the assault division or the SS. 
And if there's still a bit of class consciousness and elitist thinking left in them, they will receive further treatment from the armed forces. And when they return after two or three or four years, we'll put them back into the assault division or SS so that they won't relapse. And they shall never be free again for the rest of their lives. My uncle, 1939, with the goat given to him for First Communion. My uncle was born in 1926. In 1936, the National so Socialists announced that 90% of all children born in 1926 had successfully been recruited into the Hitler Youth. By 1939, joining had become mandatory. Kölsheim is a small town. Jews and Christians lived side by side, engaged in trade for centuries. My uncle probably knew the Jewish boys and girls who lived in town. He was 12 years old when he wrote the story in his exercise book, too young to understand the power of Nazi propaganda, but old enough to understand that Jews are not like poisonous mushrooms. From the scrapbook of a memory archivist, flea market find number one, child's play. A, caricature of a Jew, 20 cents. B, toy made in honor of the Führer's birthday, four euros. C, Hitler Youth trading cards, set of 10, two euros. B, brooches given in exchange for winter relief donations, four euros each. E, primer, one euro. It turned out that my father had gone up to the cemetery chapel and for reasons unknown even to himself, had scanned the names in the register. There, among the thousands of names his eyes rested on for a fraction of a second, names that had once been called from kitchen windows at dinner time, names written on Christmas gifts and school exercise books, names spoken severely in classrooms, names pronounced ceremoniously by mayors on enlistment day, names whispered by girls and women the night before departure, names shouted out on the battlefield when a response could no longer be expected, names reported to superiors, names spelled out on clacking typewriters in colonel secretary's offices, names read, reread, and read again on damp military stationery, names chiseled into stones, and names remembered quietly by fathers and mothers before a final breath was taken. Among all these unfamiliar names belonging to people unknown to him, my father found what he had been looking for, his own name. The number on the piece of paper my father was holding specified the exact location of my uncle's grave. The gravestone was meticulously maintained. Inscribed on it was the name that my uncle and my father had always shared. For the first time, I experienced the loss of my uncle's life in a physical way. Briefly, he emerged from the depths of the heavy mahogany cabinet, not as a shadow, but as a human being whose eyes I could have looked into and said, uncle, who could have given me a goat as a gift for First Communion, whose children's outgrown clothes I could have worn, and to whom I could have sent a postcard from Italy that summer telling him about our visit to a German World War II cemetery that was filled with gravestones inscribed with the names of total strangers. Standing at his grave, I longed to understand what it felt like to be him. Was he proud to fight in the war? Was he afraid? What was the last thing he saw, the last thought he had? This is the closest I've ever been to my brother, my father said. Two photographs placed on top of each other match perfectly. Two arms each holding a First Communion candle. Two arms each holding a hymn book. The new face that emerges looks directly at me. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Nora, uh, for Thank joining um, and for sharing that um, beautiful chapter um, and powerful <laughs> chapter as well. Um, the first thing I thought after reading Belonging was that I couldn't have imagined you know, hearing and reading about your story in any other way but this beautiful juxtaposition of art and archival materials and obviously your writing, you know, beyond this being your profession, what inspired you to tell this story in such a visual way? Um, to me, there was, from the beginning, there was no question about it. it as, you, as you said, and you're also a visual person, uh, it seemed like a very natural format. And uh, while I was researching the book, I thought a lot about memory and the nature of memory and um, the fact that memory is, is such a visual thing. Um, and um, also about the fragmentary uh, nature of memory because we uh, seem to um, see it as, a, um, as something that we try to make sense of in retrospect as a chronological thing where in fact it's not chronological at all but it still has a, a logic to it. So that's why I chose this particular format of um, this kind of scrapbook format that was a combination of um, illustrations and photographs and graphic elements and I um, used photography specifically when referring to one particular moment in history because I think that it's more powerful to experience that moment firsthand in a photograph and um, where I had to rely on my imagination because there was no visual proof available when, telling, when trying to recon visually rec reconstruct my family's lives, for instance, I, uh, I used illustration as the medium to convey that. And how did you develop that style of illustration um, to use for this book? Um, I mean, I always really struggle when I work, so it was, um, I was really basically tapping in the dark um, for a long time, partly because I didn't use the, I don't know if you can call it traditional, but uh, traditional graphic novel format uh, of panels, um, you know, that have the same structure on every page, the same amount of panels on every page with just slight variations. And so every page was a new challenge in a way because I had to think about um, whether I want to show a photograph or a drawing, what kind of a drawing. And uh, I worked chronologically through the book because I wanted to um, understand how the viewer or the reader would experience the narrative from the beginning till the end. And so with every new page, I basically, I was lost <laughs> and had to struggle my way through it. Um, and uh, there were moments that were particularly difficult to depict, which were the ones that talked about um, uh, you know, the aspect of loss from a German perspective, because mm -hmm. I, I really wanted to make sure that it didn't come across as me saying the Germans were victims too. I mean, that's something that I, um, you know, that I didn't want to convey and that I also don't, don't believe in. And um, so I tried very hard not to evoke a feeling of sentimentality in these moments where the text was very emotional. I tried to make the images retreat a little bit more. Um, yeah, because I, I really, that was the one thing I really wanted to make sure of that I don't miscommunicate. I think that was really a, a fascinating thing for me to read in, in your memoir was that you constantly stopped to reevaluate and determine, you know, is this something true or you know, I felt as a reader we were experiencing that with you, so how did you determine, you know, the way in which you were gonna make those choices, you know, both personally and emotionally to convey them and visually? Um, I mean, while I was doing the research about my family members and in particular my paternal grandfather, I, uh, I, it almost felt like I had two voices in my head the whole time. One probably represented the American perspective and the other one the German one and so the German one kept on saying, you know, of course he made horrible and wrong decisions, but he had to support a family and you have to see it from his point of view. And then the American voice would always come in and say, but he made these decisions and he didn't have to. He was free to make them or not make them. And he, you know, you have to face up to your family's past. And so it was a constant struggle in my own head. And um, I think I tried to convey that in the way I wrote the book. Um, but of course, images play a big role in terms of how we convey certain, yeah, um, certain feelings of that, or conflicted feelings as well. Mm -hmm. And so um, it took me a while to, um, to figure some of that out. Do you have any particular examples or 
moments or chapters from it that you thought this is a really complex way to tell this story in this moment in history? And if you could share kind of one of the most complex moments and maybe one of the most rewarding moments um, to show the story in a visual style. Um, I mean, there were so many moments that, uh, I mean, maybe uh, two of the most challenging moments. One was um, I found these heartbreaking letters written by my maternal grandfather's brother, who was married to a Swiss woman. He, uh, a few months before he um, became a Swiss citizen at the time, there wasn't such a thing as dual citizenship. Mm -hmm. So he wanted to become Swiss and give up his German citizenship. And a few months before he was able to do so, he received a letter from the German military drafting him into the, into the army. And he didn't want to go. He had no interest in Hitler's ideology. He had no interest in being a soldier. And he had to go because he was German. And um, so he went to Russia and he basically vanished. You know, nobody knows even today what exactly happened to him. And he wrote uh, letters to his wife and children that um, are so heartbreaking because they're not at all about the war, or that there's no ideology. You know, he, all he writes about is that he wants to come home and, uh, you know, things like, you know, you've pickled vegetables in the basement for me, but I don't know if we can eat them together this fall. And everyday things and observations, observations around nature, around him, you know, he saw chanterelles in the forest and that made him remember the times when they went out and collected uh, mushrooms in the forest together. And um, it was the first time that I actually allowed myself to feel saddened mm -hmm. about his fate because, again, I felt, you know, growing up, I felt like, well, I should, you know, I shouldn't feel that way as a German. Um, and then the question was, how do I illustrate that? Mm -hmm. Um, that was a very challenging moment for me in the book. So that was one of these moments where I decided to make the image recede by just having, quoting the letters and then uh, showing his, a drawing of his face that gradually d disappears to represent the um, disintegration, his disintegration, both physical and uh, emotional. Um, and then that's followed by the next page, which is the letter that, my, that his wife received um, when he didn't return from the, uh, what would you call it in English, from the, uh, from from that um, whatever combat they they were doing that day, um, yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, that was I think a moment that was difficult for me to figure out. Speaking of things like those letters, um, and we saw some of this when you read the excerpt on the poisonous mushroom. You have an incredible amount of personal artifacts, archives. Um, I find the fact that you had that story from your uncle, incredible, that it's, you even still have that um, in existence. Um, tell me a little bit about the process um, of retrieving some of this material and how you decided to integrate it into the book. Uh, well, the exercise book by my uncle is actually one of the few things that my family owned uh, or has, you know, the few uh, pieces of evidence uh, about that time period and our family. And uh, so what I've been doing uh, during the course of my working on this book is I've been going to flea markets uh, and household liquidation stores all across uh, Germany to look for other people's evidential objects and memories because they were able to provide the more visceral access to the experience of war and life under the Nazi regime that my own family couldn't provide me with because I never had these conversations with my grandparents and they didn't leave me with except for these exercise books and a few other things. They didn't leave me with these artifacts or these objects and items. And so I've, I've amassed a substantial amount of, of, of flea market finds that are, um, you know, they range from uh, a mother's uh, binder that she collected trying to find out where, where, where her son died and unwant, under what circumstances he died over the course of a 50-year period. Um, it's letters she wrote first to the German military, then to the Russian military because she lived in the Russian sector after the war. And it, it, it chronologically depicts uh, and, and tells the narrative of her search. And the last letter is from 2000. I think another son of hers continued the search. And uh, the letter basically says um, that um, they still can't tell them what happened to that, to that man. Um, but also I found a horrible photo album by a German soldier that includes um, photographs uh, of an atrocity committed by Germany right mm -hmm. after uh, they invaded Poland. 
and seeing this album that was, you know, that was once held in the hands of this guy who was there when this atrocity happened and chose to take took photographs and then put them in an, in a photo album, is just such a chilling experience. But it also um, it makes history come alive in such a different way than a history school book. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why I collect these things. I also think they're of hi historic importance. I want to donate them at some point to an archive. Um, oftentimes they, they fall into the wrong hands. You know, there are collectors all over the world who have, you know, collect these things for the wrong reasons. And um, yeah, I try to, to take some of that material out of their hands <laughs> by going to flea markets each time I return and yeah. looking around for what there is to find. And you describe kind of a similar experience when you're going through your grandfather's file, kind of in touching, mm -hmm. you know, that his actual paperwork with his handwriting. Do you want to share a little bit of it? Because that wasn't like that excerpt, but for instance, a little bit about what that was like to actually discover like your grandparents' files. Yeah, so what happened is that um, after the war in the American sector, which is <clears throat> where my family lived after the war, uh, every German had to fill out, uh, every German over the age of 18, I think, had to fill out a questionnaire of 400 something questions that would uh, tell the American military government something about their involvement uh, under the Nazi regime. So questions would include something like, did you ever buy real estate from a Jewish person? For how much? When? Who, is that, who was there to witness that um, transaction? And uh, based on these questionnaires, you were then ranked into five different categories, uh, ranging from major war criminal to follower to um, victim under the regime. And uh, based on what, whatever category you were ra ranked into, you were given a, a particular kind of punishment. So your bank account could be barred, you could be barred from working on your pre in your previous um, profession, you could be jailed, you could be uh, taken to a re-education camp. Um, and so these files have been made available to the public um, not that long ago. So my parents, for instance, didn't have the same possibilities of finding out what I found out. Um, and um, why, so during my research, I went to my hometown's archive and I, I typed in my grandfather's name, maternal grandfather, the, the driving teacher, and found his file and I opened it up and it was, it was the questionnaire that he had held in his hand and f filled out and it was just such a chilling uh, moment of, of um, I intimate closeness to him that I'd never experienced while he was still alive. And um, the first question in the questionnaire was, were you a member of the Nazi party? And he said yes. And that to us and my family and me came as a huge shock because uh, only 15% of all Germans were members of the Nazi party. And I say only in quotation marks because it's not that they didn't want to join, but the Nazis put a stop, I believe, in early, uh, or like in, in 1933 on membership um, because they realized that most people joined for opportunistic reasons. So um, you had to have a very good reason for joining. And then, of course, I asked myself, why did my grandfather join? He had always told my family that he had voted for the Social Democrats, which is the Democratic Party. Um, and it was the, the Nazis' biggest political enemy, basically. So uh, he had always, I believe he always voted for them. He voted for them a few months before he joined the Nazi Party, before Hitler came to, uh, after Hitler came to power. And, um, so the file revealed page by page why he joined, because he kept on writing letters to the military explaining why he joined in order to make a case for himself. And uh, it was like he was speaking to me directly. So it was a really incredible experience. Yeah. I love how you, you mentioned at the beginning in your introduction how you wanted to shine light on kind of this gray area of, you know, not a hero, you know, not a culprit, finding what you found on both your maternal and paternal uh, parent side, how did that help you in ultimately achieving your quest for your heimat, for your belonging? Yeah, um, you know, the book was never an attempt of um, getting over my feeling of inherited guilt. Mm -hmm. It's something that I grew into and that I can't change, and I also don't think I, I need to change. I think it's, it's, it's okay to feel like that. I mean. 
I mentioned this at the beginning of the presentation, we really grew up in, in, in this uh, abstract, paralyzing feeling of guilt, which unfortunately we weren't uh, also provided with the tools to then use that knowledge of our past and apply it in a more constructive way by saying, you know, how can I help create a more tolerant society now? You know, that would have been, that was really the part that was missing in our education. And I think the collective shame is, is probably not as helpful as the individual, or facing up to the individual guilt, you know, your own family's guilt, which is what I tried to do in the book. So I try to kind of um, move the guilt away from the collective and more to the personal. Um, but the, the goal was never not to feel guilty. So um, I think what it helped me was to, to, to find a more constructive way of, of dealing with the guilt. Um, and whether I found uh, the meaning of my uh, German cultural identity is, is another question. I, I think to me it's something that I will never be able to really define, mm -hmm. something that shifts, and I think I personally believe also should shift. I don't think it should be something that's static because that's what the Nazis tried to do. They tried mm -hmm. to use the term Heimat as something that would, con that would only include a particular kind of person. And um, I think that's the wrong way of, of thinking about belonging, cultural belonging. I think everybody should be allowed to have their own interpretation of what that means. Um, and it's a huge new uh, you know, discussion in Germany because of um, the many new immigrants we have and the newly emerging extreme right that feels like you know, there is only one particular static way of German cultural belonging. And it's a very dangerous thing. And um, so part of me also doesn't want to pin it down to one particular definition. But even if, even if I tried, I, I don't think I can. I think to me it's something that's deeply um, grounded in childhood and my own childhood memories, walks I took with my family in the forest and smells and um, foods that I ate. Um, so it's a, it's a highly personal experience that to me is deeply child. Uh, connected to childhood, but also therefore something that I feel like I don't really have access to anymore. I mean, I treasure it, but it's it's also lost in a way. I think it's an interesting time to be in this, you know, third generation, so to speak, because I, I relate to you in that also, I had grandparents who passed away when I was very young, so the access to certain stories were kind of immediately lost, and yet we're still in an age where we're still connected to people who were alive in the time of World War II. I know for me, growing up, being Jewish, having grandparents who were survivors, the only association I had with Germany was the Holocaust. There was really kind of a lack of knowledge beyond that, and it was I would have never thought what would somebody in my generation be experiencing from the German side of it. Um, so to read this book was so fa fascinating to me. And I'm wondering, how do you think, you know, your book, conversations like this will kind of pave the way for how we talk about the past and the future? Because I, I do think we're really at a, a turning point to how we'll speak yeah. of things. Yeah, especially now that both the, um, you know, the generations are getting older, both of the survivors and the, the war criminal or the perpetrators. And so, the big question is how do we um, how do we preserve these memories um, because we can't just learn from from history school textbooks about them and I think you know places like this museum do a wonderful job in keeping them alive also with new technologies and in Germany I was very very happy to see that the book um, is is a, it's it's a bestseller. It's number ten on the on the um, nonfiction bestseller list, and that just shows me that Germans have a deep desire to continue talking about these things. But we still need to. Th and and now the German government is actually printing a um, a different edition, a cheaper edition for educators, mm -hmm. so that it's more accessible for schools and so forth. So that's very hopeful to me. And I think we really need to always continue asking ourselves how we teach about the Holocaust. Um, and that way of looking and looking at teaching about it needs to change because times always change. And so again, it shouldn't be a static way of, of, of teaching it. We need to always redefine it. And um, at the same time, I, I do hope that, there, that there's a more universal quality to the book, which is that uh, of um, no matter where you come from, uh, you have to face up to your 
country's political past mm -hmm. because it's not a separate thing. It's in us. We are only who we are because of what happened before. And we need to recognize that there's a, a clear link that history lives in us and continues to live in us. And we have a responsibility to look at it and to um, continue to witness it by continuing to tell the stories. And um, yeah, that's really true for any country, I think. But of course, as a German, I'm mostly concerned with how that's done in Germany. Yeah. Thank you, Nora. Thank you for writing this book and, and for sharing this. Uh, we're not done yet. I <laughs> want to open up some questions for the audience. As, as a follow-up, why did your grandfather join the Nazi party? Um, I don't know how, if I, how much I should <laughs> give away. Um, um, <laughs> well, he, um, there, was a, uh, there was a driving school he wanted to buy, and uh, the car of one of the uh, leading Nazis in the region was parked in the driving school. And um, it seems like a very banal reason. And... Um, yeah, you'll read more about it if you read the book. <laughs> <laughs> Buy the book, find out. <laughs> Each wave of immigration to Europe bring more and more anti-Semitism. Reaction to policy of government of Merkel is rise of Nazism. Impossible not to see this connection. About 60% of European Jews believe that they are supposed to leave sooner or later whole continent. What gives you hope that Jewish destiny would not repeat? Not exactly like in time of Holocaust, because of all of this huge effort to educate to explain and your effort, part of common effort. And by the way, from time of Adenauer, Germany did tremendous job to eliminate, to repress, to suppress Nazism and anti-Semitism. And now we see anti-Semitism flourish around, and nothing can look and stop it. I mean, obviously, um, the re-emergence of anti-Semitism is uh, visible and palpable everywhere at the moment, including in this country, and it's horrifying and uh, tragic, and we need to fight it, you know, from the beginning. Um, I'm, I'm a big believer in empathy, so to me, um, it's, it's very important that, um, you know, I, I understand Merkel's decision of, um, you know, being inclusive, and um, helping, trying to help people in need. Whether Germany was uh, prepared for that task, you know, is another question. Um, but um, I do think that we need to, as our societies change, we need to be very, very careful that education on these subjects and on the Holocaust, again, are revisited, that we think anew about what we need to do to, um, to ed ed you mentioned the word education. Education is the key, the key word. And there are new initiatives now in Germany because of the big uh, um, wave of immigration to educate new immigrants um, who come sometimes from backgrounds and family backgrounds uh, where there is a lack of knowledge of the subject to educate them about it in Germany as part of the process of becoming German. And um, I just want to uh, talk, uh, t tell a little episode of a re uh, recent visit that I did to Germany, where I went to a play, uh, some, of, some of you may know it, uh, Brundibar, that was written by children in Theresienstadt, I believe, and performed there. Um, Maurice Sendak and Tony Kushner performed it some years ago in New York City. And uh, it was performed by a German school group um, in Berlin, and I really wanted to go because I was curious how the new generation, I mean, I think there were middle and high school students that performed the play, and I was very touched by this, you know, that they, that they, that they did that. And then after the performance, I decided to interview a few of the students about, you know, their urge to perform in this play, and one student was 
a recent immigrant. Her parents were from Egypt, and uh, she was, so she was. Uh, uh, her parents had Im emigrated to Germany, and she she herself was born in Germany. And so she said to me that as a German, she feels a responsibility to perform in this play about the Holocaust, even though her family background was Egyptian. And that really touched me. Um, and it also told me something about something being done right in terms of education. I feel like everybody who comes to Germany and decides to live there needs to become part of that education. So that's my personal viewpoint. We have uh, a question from our live stream audience. OK. Let's um, what has the reception to this book been like in Germany? What has it been like? Yeah. Uh, it's been an increase, uh, incredibly, I should probably look in the camera, uh, <laughs> incredibly positive. Um, yeah, it's a bestseller, and um, the most important literary critics have reviewed it, positively reviewed it. Um, it's been written about extensively in the media, and every time I do a reading there or an event there, people come to me afterwards. And they thank me for writing the book because I think for some Germans it really filled this gap of, um, you know, filled, filled this silence in a way. Because as I, as I mentioned earlier, we talked so much about the war and the Holocaust, but we weren't really encouraged to talk about our own families, especially when you came from a family of followers, which was the case in my family, because you, you felt like, you know, everybody everybody was a follower, what else is there to say or research? And I think that's faulty thinking because that's exactly the category we need to look at because that's the one that voted for, for Hitler. You know, that's, that's the gray zone that we need to understand in order to avoid the rise of other dictatorial regimes or to, to understand how they come to be. And um, so I think a lot of Germans felt uh, by reading the book um, an encouragement to go back and research their own families and also asked me where they could begin. And that to me was really the biggest, that's the, the biggest gift to me um, that, um, you know, that to me was why it was worth for me personally to write the book, because it means that more people are asking questions and going back into their own families. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm interested in the, the guilt that you said that translates um, history living in our body and how that translates to guilt. When you said that, I realized, like, for me, it's the victim that translates through my generations. And <laughs> Same phone. <laughs> it's not the right soundtrack to the question. But. No, not for victim, no. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm interested in somatically how that translates in my body. And I'm wondering if you talk about that in your book, how somatically you feel that in your body or, or behaviorally or emotionally. I'm just curious. You mean how it um, subconsciously also makes me think or act in a particular way? Yeah, or? in a personal, like, I don't know if you explore that in your book, but how that, you know, that sort of infiltrates your, your daily life, that yeah. perspective? Because I understand the victim, but I don't understand yeah. that one. So uh, at the beginning of the book, I write about the fact that one of the um, reasons that propelled me to write the book is the awkwardness I feel whenever I have encounters with people who are you know, on the side of the victims. Um, uh, I have to say that my, my husband is Jewish, and I have a lot of Jewish friends. And there, it's never an issue, because we're just who we are. But when I meet people who don't know me and I don't know what their thinking might be about a German person, you know, especially a German person writing about the war from a German perspective, I always feel deeply insecure. Um, and so my gut reaction is always to feel this collective shame. You know, it just kicks in whether I try, I just can't control it. Um, and uh, maybe I can tell another quick uh, episode. Um, so. S 16 years ago, I uh, visited, I had just moved to New York City and I visited a friend um, in an apartment building on the Upper West Side uh, and she decided that we should go up on the rooftop. This is actually a story I, uh, that the book begins with. And I was speaking to her and there was an elderly woman sitting on the rooftop and she um, overheard our conversation and she approached me and said, where, where are you from? And I said, I'm from Germany. And then she said, that's what I thought. 
and there was an awkward silence. And then I said, um, you know, I, I was trying to do small talk, and Germans aren't very good at that. So I said, uh, have you ever been to Germany? Which was probably a naive question to ask. And she said, yes, a long, long time ago. And then I realized, you know, that this woman was a survivor. And then she went on to tell me uh, how she had been rescued 16 times in the last moment from the gas chamber by a female concentration camp guard who was incredibly violent to everybody else in the, in the camp but had taken a particular liking to her and she didn't know why, but 16 times this woman rescued her and that's why she survived. And uh, it was just a five minute encounter, but I, yet again, I just stood there and I didn't know what to say. And just the immediacy with which I was confronted with that history and the unexpectedness was so powerful to me. And it was one, this encounter, this woman was one of the reasons why I wrote the book. And um, after I had finished the book, you know, I had no, I didn't know who she was, I didn't know her name, I had only had this five minute conversation with her, or me, even less than five minutes. And uh, after I had finished writing the book and it was going to go to the press, I thought, let me research that woman again because I might want to, you know, give her the book when it's done. I mean, I didn't know how would she feel that I wrote about her, how does she feel about Germans in general, I felt very awkward about it but I had an urge to meet her again because she had left such a deep impression on me. So I, I Googled something. I mean, I, the only thing I had to go on was 16 times gas chamber, so that's what I Googled. And the website came up uh, about uh, by a Jewish organization and uh, where she had given a talk a few years ago. And uh, there was a photograph and I immediately recognized her in the picture. And her name was, you know, under the photograph. And so I thought, should I try to find her? And I um, asked a friend of mine who was deeply connected to the Jewish emigre uh, community in New York City, and I thought maybe he knows how I could find her phone number. And so within half a day, he texted me and said, I found out where she lives. I went there on my lunch break. I called her on the security <laughs> guard phone and told her about you. And I felt really, you know, I didn't want to, <laughs> I felt a little nervous about it because I felt like, um, what if she doesn't want to hear from me, you know? But it, it's wonderful that he did. I mean, it's, um, and uh, so then I, uh, you know, he said she is curious to find out, you know, why you want to meet her. And she doesn't remember your encounter. And so then uh, I pushed it off a few weeks because I was nervous. Mm -hmm. And then I called her. And then uh, something happened that never had happened ever to me in my life before, which is that I broke out in tears in front of a stranger. So I called her and I said, you know, I met you 16 years ago and my, uh, you know, it just, it meant so much to me. Um, <laughs> and, um, and so she, um, yeah, she, and then, and then I realized that the, the reason for why it, uh, it was so important to me was because she, uh, she physically represented um, what I had been learning about in theory in school all these years. Um, and, and she just standing in front of me, uh, her like this was just such a, an immediate, uh, you know, I don't know, illustration of, of, of history. And then she invited me to lunch to her place at the same exact building where we had met, met 16 mm -hmm. years before on the rooftop. Wow. And we had a three hour lunch and she told me all about, um, you know, how this happened. And, um, and then we were excited about our new friendship and we said we, we should meet again when I'm coming back from my European book tour. And then when I came back, and she called me while I was on book tour, and then I call, uh, called her back when I, um, when I came back, and the number was disconnected, and I Googled her, and it turned out she died a few weeks ago. And it was just so sad, um, you know, for many, many reasons, but also because I, I felt like there were so many questions I had wanted to ask her, and she was my new friend, you know? And um, that's... That's why we have to preserve these stories. Sorry, that was a very long answer to your question. It's incredible that you got to meet her. Yeah, I'm so grateful away. that I was able to meet her. But We have time for one more question, Sorry. and then copies of Belonging will be for sale down the hallway, and Nora will be signing them in the lobby. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the, art, the artists who've influenced you, graphic artists or otherwise, and if, 
you've kind of reconciled with German culture, music and art and whatever, you know, from before, you know, the Nazis? Um, yeah, to answer your first, uh, the, the second part of the question, uh, I actually went to a classical music middle and high school, and violin was my first instrument, my most important instrument. I almost ended up studying classical violin, and so, of course, I played a lot of German composers. Bach is one of my fa uh, most favorite composers. Um, and it was only because of that school that I learned so much about that part of my German heritage. I actually have a group of friends who perform uh, old German folk songs uh, in a cappella style, and also comedian harmonist songs, but also these old folk songs that uh, I, ne I would have never, you know, I never learned, basically. I mean, I learned them through them. And I just recently did an audio book for Scribner of this book, and I was able to um, convince them to sing, uh, to provide two songs for the recording. Um, and, um, yeah, that was... Um, that's, I'm always very touched when I listen to these songs because I feel like it, it, it does provide a connection point for me to my culture that is so conflicted in so many other ways. Um, in terms of my visual influences, I think I'm very influenced by a German expressionist, you know, George Gross, Otto Dix, and uh, who have also done a lot of uh, work on war and who were basically pacifists, who didn't shy away from looking and witnessing as artists, um, which I think is so important. I mean, I always feel like, imagine what our notion would be like of the Holocaust if no photographs had been taken or if the photographs hadn't been made uh, accessible to the public. I think it would be a very different understanding of the Holocaust. So I'm such a proponent, a proponent of looking and witnessing and showing, and I think far too much image, uh, too many images are censored, you know, mm -hmm. today also of the wars that we're involved in. We see just a fraction of the photographs that are actually taken by the US military. And I think it's a problem because it makes us feel completely disconnected from the wars that we're involved in. But anyway, that's just a side note. Um, of course, I'm also really influenced by all the other wonderful uh, non-fiction visual work that's done on war, on war um, but also on other personal, um, you know, identity questions, uh, Alison Bechtel, um, Mouse, obviously, um, people like Lauren Redness and Myra Kalman. I mean, there's such a wealth of also female uh, artists working in nonfiction narrative these days. But what uh, I have to say, while I was working on the book, I actually tried not to look at too much of that stuff. So what I was focusing on more were uh, both nonfiction writers. I'm a big mm -hmm. fan of uh, people like Alexandra Fuller, for instance but also uh, documentary filmmakers who use documentary film in an essayistic way. Werner Herzog, but also Joshua Oppenheim, who did The Act of Killing and The Look of Silence, really such an enlightening, wonderful, and difficult to watch, but important to watch film. So documentary film and nonfiction writing were the two main areas I looked at while working on the book. No, uh, when I went to high school and middle school, uh, there were uh, survivors who came from America and talked to us. And I thought about, you know, why was this encounter of that woman on the rooftop so different for me? And I think it was uh, the unexpectedness and the intimacy of the encounter, because it was basically just the two of us and my friend. And also her honesty and, and her... She also talked about the experience in what felt like a generous way. I mean, she... She just told me what happened. She didn't try to make me feel bad. She didn't, it was, um, I don't know. I just felt, I guess, a deep connection to her as a person, which is why I wanted to connect with her again and why it was so sad that um, our friendship didn't last very long, but. Very, very sorry to hear it. Um, I think, based on how you know the su success of the book, uh, I think many Germans, at least of my generation, feel very much like I do. I think many have this feeling of of guilt. Many don't know what to do with it. You know how to apply it. I can't speak to the younger generation because I just don't know them because I don't live in Germany. Uh, I can only say my own daughter who is growing up in America. She's, uh, we're hoping to send her to a German school, and 
That's actually very important to me because I want her to learn about the Holocaust. I mean, she's three now, but you know when it's time. Um, from a German perspective, because I think it'll be a perspective that's not from a distance. You know, that's a perspective of facing up rather than this is what, what happened somewhere else and what was done by somebody else. So I'm very happy that she will be able to get that kind of Holocaust education in America. Um, but hopefully doing more book tours in Germany, I, I will find out more about the younger generation. And it's an important turning point. It needs to be taught you know, extensively, and yeah. Thanks for coming to the talk. I also want to thank my wonderful editor, uh, Lise Meyer, who is sitting in the audience, who was uh, the key person who shaped the narrative in the book, because I had far too much material, and without her, I would have been lost and written a 3,000-page book. <laughs>